you have to figure out this relationship of like, wow, if my hands do this, the club does this, right? Like that's where we're different. Is that basically telling you that each hand has to do like it has to maintain tautness. Right. And then you can utilize it in the way that it needs to work. Mm. But if you're not utilizing each hand, like they both have to put in hundred percent. Really. Right, if right. you want the like most consistent go like this and like does this make sense to practice at home? Absolutely <laughs> right. not. Like the bird. Know, the bird. It's like it's like bird sitting in there and he's like, What the heck are you? Create doing? your cage. Yeah. This right. Is close. <laughs> Is 90% hands and arms. It used to be like back in the 20s and 30s with Harry Varden and Henry Cotton and all these guys, they were saying that it was 90% hands and arms, 85 and 90. Where did that get lost? Like, why? Why did we lose that? We are live. How's it going, everybody? Welcome back to the Cause and Effect podcast, where we introduce the cause and effect relationships that exist in golf in relation to the hand to handle to club relationship. Episode 14, it's cold in Michigan. It's really cold. Yeah, it's it went from like kind of being 70s, like okay, maybe 60s. Now it's like 30, 40, which I is, yeah. yeah, welcome to Michigan. Yep. Um, yeah, this episode, it's going to be really just focused on the chair. Like we're, we're sitting in a chair right now. We've, we had some really good feedback from the last episode of just how people were actually wanting us to like do these little like half clubs mm -hmm. that we're like, you're using. Yeah, right, yeah. Uh, yeah. And I think it'd be cool. Like if we had these half clubs yeah. and we said like, Hey, like grab your half club, everybody like follow along. Right. You know, it's like a cool way to just like follow along with what we're talking about. Because um, like we said in the intro, like hand to handle the club relationship, mm -hmm. we don't say anything about body feet in that relationship. Like we're hand to handle the club that's how we're different. It's because our code was created in a chair. Right. So technically, like, the main source of it all comes from, like, the hand-to-hand -hand club relationship, which is right here. But by making the club shorter, it's an easier perspective of what's actually going on. So, like, if the club right. is longer, right, it's, like, way <laughs> harder to actually get that realization of really um, what's going on, but also the speed, right? Yeah, yeah. So, like, when you're not actually trying to hit something here... Like eventually, maybe we'll have a ball that hangs down from like this <laughs> right. thing, like that old thing. You remember like, that old thing yeah, they used yeah. to have? You hit it and it spun around, and then would like try to calculate how far the ball would go. Literally, I remember. yeah, absolutely. it was crazy. But like you could actually careful, do something. Careful with like, that club. Our club, yeah, is, but I mean, like, our club's a little compromised right now. It's got like it a, little, a little, like a little, little slash break in it. But no, uh, your claws are too like, strong for it. <laughs> but yeah, like you could just whack the ball like this though, and it would be, give you like a kind of a reading. Like that'd be kind of cool though. Yeah, that'd be um, really cool. Yeah, because. Then it's like dimples just like dangling from like the ceiling or whatever. But yeah, like it would, it would be able to determine like the angle you're coming in at it, how fast it's like, uh, what was that tether ball? Remember yeah. that? Like, oh, in, yeah. in, oh, like yeah. in elementary school and sure. middle school. Yeah. We basically just create like a tether ball thing for like golf. We'll probably or mount this thing up like behind your chair. So it'll stick up and then it will like have the 45 plane and the ball's like right here to start on <laughs> and then you hit it. And then if you're on the right angle, it'll like go all the way around right, like, right. or else it'll like fly off a little bit like a tether ball. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And, and that's the big thing too, is that we want to do a lot of things with the chair because not a lot of people have time to like go to the range and like right. work on all this stuff with their golf swing. And I don't know, like, what do you do if you're like somebody like us, like in Michigan where it's cold and you don't have the ability to go to a range. Like, how can you improve your golf swing? Yeah, you can get and, a mat and stuff in at home and everything. No, but, but I'm saying, like, right here. Like, I mean, right, right. Like how... Why not utilize it if you understand how to, you know, what things you can learn? You know, we've talked about this in the, you know, past podcast, but um, truly understand, like, what you can do drill-wise in the chair is really big. And what's, the kind of stuff you would, like, give, what's the kind of stuff you would give your students to, like, work on? Because I know I would give my students, like, a lot of things, like, learning like how to create the swing triangle things like that like what's some stuff you would give people i would tell people that when you learn to grip the club learn it like sitting in your chair mm -hmm. like learn how to mold your grip right why is that without the golf club yeah because you're trying to create a holster right right so it's like we're not just like gonna go like this and like does this make sense to practice at home absolutely <laughs> right. not like the know, bird <laughs> the bird right? yeah the bird's like bird's create... sitting in there and he's like what the heck are you create doing? your cage yeah so oh, but, but like okay. you know getting the curls and then locking <laughs> your hands and so like this was pretty much one of the things that um i would try to explain to him is take your index finger point it straight away and then the trail thumb is also like um pinched with that 
external pinch like we talked about with finger extension mm. because it allows you to feel like all the energy going away from your body. So even though you're sitting in a chair, you feel the tautness. Right, right, right. right. Opposed to like, if you curl it like this, it's okay. Yeah. But like, then you have to feel like the stretch through the knuckle more. So it just was like an idea for them to feel more of that finger extension pressure. Got it. So as they would rehearse their move, sitting in a chair, once they got their grip, they could work on their quarter to quarter swing at home on commercial breaks. And, <laughs> right, you know, right. But that was Absolutely. like better for them because, once you know, it's like five minutes. And it's like if you do that three or four or five times a day, it becomes pretty easy. And then you can move on to more things. Right, right. And you can basically in a chair take like you know like a half to half or actually i mean you can technically take a full swing yeah but it's just um we're like restricted with our mics and stuff here but i mean i can get my arms back to here which is almost like half i yeah, would say i think so. and coming through it's like half right um but if you just perfect the idea of like what's going on there and you just rep it then when you stand up it's going to be one of those things where it's like kind of natural um, you don't have to like think about it as much. Right. It won't feel so weird. Oh. And then you can work on your legs and, you know, you can work on the rotation stuff and the footwork um, simply like with the drills we're going to show you yeah. at home and stuff too. But with like but alignment right here, rods and stuff, really but like, but then when it comes though, to the hand to the hand of the face, a, that's like the unity of like the key connection. That yeah. Because we have I mean, them. I think a lot of people need to just focus their attention on that. Like it'll just make their life so much easier. Like a lot of right. people don't really need to focus on the body a lot at all at first when they're learning like they just have to, to preset their, their, their body a little just bit preset. they need basics yeah. they need basics though yeah, i will for say sure. that because swaying is one of the worst problems but the cool but, thing but about being you, in a chair well that's the key moving. though right yeah right, so right. that's where i mean yeah if you start people, off this way yeah, then, then you realize move, like yeah. wait why would i move mm -hmm. like i was just sitting in my chair last night like working on my golf swing right. i didn't move right why now that i'm standing over the golf ball and i've graduated from the chair to the golf posture, why would I move? The club you know? can move quite a distance in a chair without really moving your That's torso. That's so key. Like, right. what we just said there, like, once people realize, like, you can... That's why we need to create that little, like, golf ball thing hanging down and just hit yeah. it. It's like, hey, be, be like, whoa, like, my golf ball did that just by me doing this basic, like, hands and arm move. It's like, yeah. That's it. Like, that's all you need. And if you can actually hit this ball properly straight, then it means you can probably hit off your knees, too. Yeah, exactly. Which kind of right. cool. Like, yeah, right. About so your buddies. Go, so, you like... grad, this, so the steps are like chair, like practice swing in a chair, then hit off your knees, then get into a golf posture. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> That'll be the steps. Because the torso can rotate a little bit more if you're not in a chair because you're not, I mean, you, technically, if the chair has no sides, we'll say, right? Right. But, um, and we're yeah, pretty restricted this, too with our mics and stuff. Like, yeah, we would probably like we would move. I don't know. We wouldn't move. We much have a gun though. No, because I mean the golf club from here. I, like if I go one handed, it's fine. I can get all the way back to like the top here. Yeah, yeah. And then come through and then you know get it to release to that point. So one like, thing, post impact, one thing but, we talked about last episode, which I want to expand a little bit more on that. And again, this whole episode just me focus more around like the chair, like in the claw code videos that we're gonna do we're actually going to introduce a lot of these things like in a chair right? Like, before we start talking about like being like in your golf posture and worrying about like what your body's doing and all this stuff. And like, this is why we talk about the preset of the body a lot. It's cause that takes that variable out. Like right. the body's once already you in a stand, position. Once you get up and bend forward, yeah. that's kind of how you statically but are isolating. The thing I really want to talk about yeah. is um, the fingers being extended away from the palm. We talked about it a lot last week and I want to go a little bit deeper into it. And you had the really awesome visual of imagining that there was like, like, um, like some rubber like bands. rubber bands yeah. or something like pulling the fingers yeah, back like across like, like, yeah, the knuckles can like you, this. Yeah. can you maybe explain a little bit more on like why that's so important? Like you said it right off the bat when you said what you would teach people is you would teach people how to like grip their golf club like this. And automatically when you're doing this, you're taking those knuckle pads and you're pushing them like away from your body, right. but your fingers are like flexing back. Like, why is that so important? Like it's, it's grip related. <clears throat> it's, it's backswing related. Like let's have that be the theme of everything we talk about today. Yeah. You know, um, it comes down to the holsters. Like we talked about where like, so if you're, um, let's say you get like your hands to where your lead thumb is properly in relation to your trail hand where, you know, um, we'll say lead thumb to trail palm. Mm. Right. Getting that relationship is the key for all grip types, doesn't matter. And then if we go like vertical here and you just feel that extension away, it's like working them in unity, right? To where it's like, 
Yeah, because the, I mean, you could go palm to palm and do the same thing. But if you do it this way, it just helps you understand, like if you're going to flex a lead wrist or you're going to cup it, you're still creating the same tautness. Got it. Okay. And so it's just a little bit of a different action with the lead wrist, but that's it. And the that trail wrist is working in unison and with that. And that tautness is so important because, because that's the Because it's the, the interconnection foundation. of your arms to your body. So to keep your swing triangle tight and keep your elbows locked in mm. front of your chest, like that has to be consistent. So Hogan had this really famous thing where he had a rope tied around the elbows right. in his five lessons book. He said he wanted your elbows to be tight, but your wrists to be oily. Right. And that's kind of what we're talking about, yeah. right? The idea though is that like, think about it too, that if you're like the under parts of your hands and arms are like a unit and they're connected mm. and then you can work the top parts of like your index fingers and thumbs relative to it with rotation it can move very fast mm. because you're pushing so tight in a Got sense it. like you, there's that connection where it's not like moving all over the place it's very directed and then from there then you can really control it's like controlling your car with your <laughs> right. steering wheel exactly. right like it's we like said. you're not trying to go off in one direction or use one hand more than the other technically right. they should work together and create Got like it. this thing for the steering And then that's wheel. why like your body, once once we do these like chair drills and everything, is that you realize like, wait, I don't have to use my body as much. Like, why would I? Because mm -hmm. all the attention is focused on keeping that tautness and keeping that pressure stretched right. away. Because once you feel this, then it's locked. And now it's like, okay, now you push and you twist. And now like, let's describe more about how, like, how do you steer your car now? Like you've got the connection, you've right. got your hands on the steering wheel. Like, how are you steering your car? Talk about that a little bit more. It's just like imagining the 45 degree plane around your body, like that the club's supposed to work on. Mm -hmm. Right. But you have like a distance from like the distance, the handle works around it. Mm -hmm. And then the distance, the club head works around it and they together create a mirror image. Right. Mm. In a sense. So like when you think about the hand to handle to face relationship, like what you're doing right here with your hands, right? Yeah. Like with pushing away and then twisting, that is virtually creating like the hand path, right? Which is okay. like the butt end of the club path. Got it. Which then influences the club head path. Oh. Right. And with our short club, it's a little bit different because we're only working with maybe like 16 inches maybe or something like right, that. Right, right. Yeah. So it's like with a driver, it's going to be a lot further. So it's <laughs> right. easier to kind of see that. Yeah. But it's under just standing like that 45 degree plane. And how it's again working around the torso and how, again, the influence we have here with the hands against the butt end then creates this like mirror around where the butt end's working Got for the it. club head. Got it. And just imagine it that way. And it like kind of makes more sense because you can almost feel what's actually going on. Like you can feel the 45 degree plane or like visualize it in your mind. Yes. Opposed to having no awareness Correct. of like what the club's doing. It could be going like this. Or going like that, yeah. Or pulling in like this, or like that, right? And it's just very important we understand or get familiar, right, with actually what the club is supposed to be doing. If we do it right here in the chair in the beginning, out in front of you, it becomes very simple, and you can learn it like just a few days, like really, or like begin your you know experience. Be, yeah, begin the experience, right? And that, right. And that's the thing when we talk about like the handle being the steering wheel, the right. club face being the car, the swing plane being the road. We've talked about this in a lot of the podcasts, but that's really the easiest way to visualize like the plane and the angle your club has to swing on. Right? right. And then you realize like, why would I do all these other things that like, why would I worry about moving laterally? Right. Like, why am I going to move out of my driver's seat into the passenger seat and so, then into the driver's seat? So it's like, yeah, it just makes it easier to steer your car. And yeah. So like back to the idea of like the hand path and the club head path, mm -hmm. it's like you're creating like a circle in a sense, like a small circle around like your hands on a 45 uh -huh. and then the club head again. Right. But if you imagine that what your hand circle does and how it works, like, in a let's say a perfect 45 degree uh -huh. um, oval. Yeah. The club head, if it goes crazy and it's not, and it starts, you know, kicking in weird ways or like snapping, you know what I mean? Um, then you're going to understand where the root problem is and why though. Mm -hmm. It makes more sense of like, if the hand pass circle is right, then the club head path or is like circle should be, I mean, it doesn't take much to get it in the right way. It's like, this doesn't make sense. Yeah. This doesn't make sense. It's <laughs> right. like, this actually makes sense because it creates the two ovals. Got it. Creating so that symmetry is like. The key. So you're basically just trying to keep those ovals like in alignment, right? Correct. Like you don't want this oval to go here and this oval to go yeah, here it, too. There's going to be a Or you reaction. don't want like yeah. this oval to go here and this oval to go here. Mm -hmm. um, like 
some instructors we see that talk about like the really like exaggerated like Matthew Wolf thing. It's like, eh, which it works. It does, it does work. work. It I've does. tried it myself, and Absolutely. it does work. It does but... work, but uh, for the average person, it's just, yeah, it's, it's it takes a lot of practice and time, and mm -hmm. it's just tough. Mm -hmm. But um, like you said, those ovals, like we we could almost have like a game someday where you're like looking at it and going like, okay, how am I at this like checkpoint position, and how are my ovals? Like, okay, I'm good here, and I'm good here. Like, perfect. Now I go to the top. It's like, how are my ovals? Right. And if at any point those like circles or ovals are off, then that's going to create a certain effect on like what the club is doing. Right. Right. And that all goes back to that hand to handle the club relationship. Mm -hmm. It's that you have to be aware of the effect that these have on like how good of a golfer you can really be right. and how well you can steer your car. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's why we like that ball, like that claw ball thing, because it's, yeah, it, that's why the grip is so important too, right? Because when you're holding like a cylinder, like the golf grip, it's really important that you hold it properly. Because if you like twist that, that's gonna have like a really dramatic effect. If you like hinge it up, it's gonna have a dramatic effect. So you have to figure out this relationship of like, wow, if my hands do this, the club does this, right? Like that's where we're different. Is that we're giving you the education of like the hand, like if the hands do this, the club does this. Right. right. And honestly, the biggest, like simplest way to think about it is just that we're basically telling you that each hand has to do like it has to maintain tautness. Right. And then you can utilize it in the way that it needs to work. Mm. But if you're not utilizing each hand, like they both have to put in 100 percent. Really. Right, if right. you want the like most consistent swing. Correct. So that's it. Opposed to one overriding the other. It's like the lead hand should not be just bowed and just floating around and just completely controlled by the trail hand. Which, I mean, it can work, and I've tried it, and it has, but Jordan it will Chief. not last. Yeah. It won't. I mean, yeah, and you'll have some, you know, pretty bad days with contact and stuff and direction, yeah. of course. But It's like, but why? That's, that's, why would you? Right, like, just, like, keep them, it like, make them to be. work as a unit. And that's why these trains we're creating are actually the ways to, in a sense, like, trick you to realizing, like, without knowing it with, like, claw ball, you're holding, like, this in this cylinder that's with the golf the club sticking wheel. through it. Right. But it's, like, but everything is equal. And right. the, same, the hands are the same distance away from the body. Same so pressure. So once you, like, re like, understand that relationship, then when your, you know, trail hand goes below the weed hand, you go to take the grip, type, whatever it is, mm -hmm. you're going to still feel that equal amount of pressure being applied mm. um, away from the body. And that's, again, what our what we're trying to, again, really get people to realize. And when we say these, when we create these visuals for people, like, hey, the, your ovals or your circles have to do a certain thing, it's like, yeah, but I'm not holding an oval or a circle. I'm holding a cylinder. But it's like if we put a oval or a cylinder, or if we put an oval or a circle on that cylinder, then people are like, oh, now they can get that visual of like, okay, that circle or oval of the club face has to match up with this circle here. Mm -hmm. And you can really start to understand like those matchups. And it's like, oh, okay. Like it's yeah, easier to Yeah, there's like visualize. a butt into the club plane and then there's Correct. a club head plane relative to it. And if they again match up, yes. it creates this perfect mirror 45 on a, or a, a, a perfect oval on a 45 degree tilted axis. And that's what every right? tour player is like Around striving to do. Right, Right. Like there's some that obviously like You go a little more in out or a little like, out to end. But, yeah, but they're yeah. at the end of the day, the main thing is that at pre-impact, those ovals have to be perfect. Correct. You well, can't... that's what the pros are doing is that, exactly. you know, they change their ovals up because <laughs> they hit fades, they hit draws. And I mean, every right. pro can work the ball both ways. Correct. Some like to, you know, favor one or the other as far as a draw or a fade. But when it comes down to it, they can all do it. And it's just, again, understand how your ovals are going to change relative to how you're trying to hit the golf ball. Like what quadrant are you hitting relative to your intended target? And if you can do that mm. at a setup... Then it's like allowing you to be able to then do the same kind of generic stat or uh, like the same stock swing. Got it. But like then again, create like a different ball flight just because of again setting up your, um, we'll say your like static angles, got right? It. With like alignment, yeah, feet alignment, exactly, things like right. that. I gotcha. Because right. again, you can do the same move and hit the ball three different ways. Yeah, because it's just basically with like you know direction. Because that road map, like we talked about in previous episodes, is it's just. Hit it's that roadmap is based on the quadrant that you're trying to hit. Right. Right. Like if you're trying to hit the outside quadrant, that's going to be the path that you're following. But that doesn't mean that we <laughs> want you staying square with your body and your toe alignment, never changing that. And then trying to manipulate your hands and arms. Cause that's I think hard. a lot of people out there, 
uh, think that that's actually what you do. Right. Um, like, oh, I swing steeper yeah, and I yeah, chop yeah. down it's like, more. Oh, it's like, whoa, Or like whoa. you learn how to draw the ball, and the worst thing I've ever heard is, oh, I'm going to use my old slice swing. It's like, wait, wait a minute. Like, no, 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 no. no, no. Like, keep your draw move. Yes. Let's get our setup right. It's like, <laughs> yeah. because otherwise, <laughs> then you're probably going to be dealing with that problem for the rest of the round and maybe a few more. Right, because it creates back. like it creates a different kind of like gear. It's effect, a hand and right? arm relationship relative to your body. Right. Right. So, right. I mean, at the end of the day, like we're just trying to create a consistent like gear effect from right. pre that has impact minimal to impact to post impact. And it has, um, it has uh, minimal like negative influences on your body. Meaning like, it's not going to like be pulling your back out or pull on <laughs> shoulders or cause you to be off balance. It's going to make it simple to be able to stay in balance and to be able to stay in posture because yeah. again, everything's working in the right way. Right. Um, whereas again, if you start, you know, doing certain things too much, like, you know, it can then be problematic on your body. Right. 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 And that's the thing too, is that for some people, um, understanding that if you're just like in your chair here and you're swinging on this like 45 degree angle that we're kind of talking about, and you've got like your ovals or your circles in the right spot, when you're coming in, you almost need to feel like the club is going like out away from your body opposed to like pulling in and being in here. Yeah, Everybody always thinks like, oh, when you're coming through, you need to pull the handle and like keep everything working on the same arc. And it's like, no, for most people, for the average golfer, they need to feel it going like out away from like the like target well, the line. The biggest right? thing is it doesn't matter if you work the handle in consciously or you keep it going more outward. Uh -huh. You have to keep the tautness and keep like your lead hand pinky pad pressure here pushing so that your lead arm stays locked mm. because that's going to control the pivot point you need no matter what. There has to be a pivot point. If you just pull through, the lead elbow is going to chicken wing. You're going to hold off your release. And then there's a lot of different options that can happen with how the gear effects can work relative <laughs> right, right. to what club you're hitting. Yeah. Um, and I mean, it just makes it to where honestly, like even if you have a great trail hand pushing down the line, so it's always, that's always pushing, you know, in that feeling of 45 degrees, almost away from the sternum. Yes. But like the lead hand though, again, depending on again, what your uh, tendencies are yeah. some pros that are stuck inside out too much or have been, to feel you see them top. doing these crazy over the top swing, like practice swings, like Jordan Spieth's doing it now. He yeah. gets up to the top and then just rips his shoulders and everything open. Justin trying to, Thomas is doing it too. To prevent yep. the club from dropping too far inside out. And I totally, of course, understand that. Right. Um, but for the average golfer, that's they not do. the issue. <laughs> right. Like they have their pivot points established for the most part. Yeah. Um, I just feel like uh, for the average golfer, really, you know, you get the stronger grip to start off with. You go through the basics of just understanding like how if you set the handle forward, you put your weight on your lead side, pre-close a little bit. Learn how to hit a draw first. See it happening. Take a divot in front of the golf ball, mm -hmm. right? Like get those first, and you can start off by doing this all in your chair. Right. So it's like you just start off with the handle like this, and then you just set the club back to here, and you come through, and you're like pushing down, out, and away yes. as this would be like impact, and the club will end up like vertical. So it's like you start off here, push, pull, set it back on the forty-five, which is just basically parallel to the ground, and that is the pivot point for your takeaway. Exactly. Right. And then from there, we're pushing back down and then the club will come back up. But that just kind of explains the feeling that when you go to hit the ground, you're trying to scrape. You're trying to get the leading edge of the golf club to like with the heel to hit the ground first. And then the pressure is applied all the way um, basically to the toe. And it may not be all the way to the toe, but it's going to be a good, I would say at least three quarters of the way right. always to where it's making contact. And that scrape is because of this push pressure. So again, mm. if like you put your weight left and you pre-close, like maybe in your chair, you can just kind of lean toward your left side and put your weight on your left hip, and then kind of pop your left shoulder up a little bit. And then that helps you feel the same thing in your chair. Mm. And a thing too is that when you're doing that, you can almost imagine that there's like a laser beam from like your lead elbow and wherever that's pointing would basically be like, we could almost have like, you're sitting in your chair and we could like have on like your wall or something like a flag. And then like you're in your chair and you're like, look this way. And see, like, where are you relative to your chair? Is your or relative to the flag? It's like, is your lead elbow pointing left of the flag? Is it pointing at the flag, or is it pointing to the right of the flag? Right. So we could set up this little like kind of station for you to kind of measure that or whatever, just to see, like, are you pre-closed enough? And by pre-closed, we mean just like kind of um, are your turned angles a little pointing bit, to the pointing to like the away right. from your target, right? Yeah, exactly. Right. Yeah. Yep. Or left, or the yeah, left yeah. if you're a lefty. Yeah. Um, but 
Um, and then from there, just that being like where you're trying to release the club to. Yeah, because yeah. when you think about shoulders, it's not perfectly level with the forearms. Even if you have a weak grip, mm. even the lead hand's going to be like this. So this is pretty flat with the lead arm. Um, the trail arm and hand are going to be just slightly tucked underneath. And you mm. need that for your swing wall to basically brace so that you can get your gear effect right with your hands in the release point opposed to pulling through. Because if the lead elbow is turned out and then the trail elbow would be turned out like... Um, like or it's like they'll say like turned in like oh, this too it, much yeah, or yeah. like uh, turned under like putting too much, yeah. then it would cause for a lack of like control. Like if the trail hand is too far under and the lead hand is too far under, it's to keep the face perfectly square. <laughs> Which is like, like what that's, we want That's putting. again what we're doing in putting. Yes. But when it comes to the, we want to use some type of rotational gear effect with the club to create speed, then we want to make sure that, you know, we get like the lead hand and arm at least level and then the trail hand arm should be always underneath more. Right. Yeah. In one thing you mentioned earlier and I want to kind of expand on this a little bit more is the pivot points. Like, can you expand a little bit more on like what those are? And that's really the whole genius of everything that we're kind of talking about with the chair is that you're basically creating these pivot points for how the club is going to consistently pivot to the top of the swing and then pivot to the follow through properly. Right. If you can get that right and that right then it's pretty easy to get the club from to the top to pre-impact to impact to connect to this one over here, right? Right. Like, can you expand on that maybe a little bit more? Like, yeah. what are the pivot points? So the takeaway position here yes. when the club is parallel to the ground. Uh -huh. And then the main pivot points are that and then pre-impact when it's back to the similar position, the handle is just more forward or closer to the starting point than it was in the takeaway. And then post-impact when it gets back to parallel. So like the three parallels that we've said before. Yeah. Um, but those are the three main and then like technically total wise though, like if you go to, um, your half three quarter full swing, there is yeah. another pivot point, More, yeah, right. like change in direction. And a pivot point just means again, like the handle is, um, basically working in a sense relative to the club head where there's a change in direction. Mm. And that's why the, back to the hand to handle the club mm -hmm. relationship, if your hands are doing a certain thing, then that's sending a certain signal to the handle of the golf club to then make the club head do a certain thing, right. right? So the pivot points are basically you sending the proper information with your hands or your claws to the handle to go, okay, handle, send the proper information to the club to send it in the proper direction. Right. Right. That's and, the key. And the reason we say the three parallels are so key is because um, getting the club basically in, at that point where, again, the handle and the club head are relatively like parallel to each other um, is so important. Whereas if I t take the club back, Club head's too far outside, and I come in outside. Of course, you're outside in, right? And you're hitting if like I get the outside inside, quadrant, right? It, yeah, yeah. If I get too inside in the takeaway, too inside coming in like this, it's going to be a bigger draw, more inside out, right? So we're trying to just kind of ride closer to that plane. And again, of course, like relative to your tendencies, you know, you might want to ride a little bit more inside. And for the majority of the average golfers, that's mm. going to actually benefit them, opposed to like eventually you might graduate to being inside out really good and you're drawing everything good. And then you can not, might actually feel like in your takeaway, sending it straight, uh, taking it straight back, you take it out like with the, not taking it like out with the handle away from your body as much more, but it's more of just like the direction of the club had relative to the handle. So it's like it. a clock system. We start at noon here. It's like, here's one o'clock, two o'clock and then three o'clock. Mm. Right. Or it'd be like here, here, and then here. Got it. So, um, basically, you know, if you're again, someone that's steep, you might be trying to take it to four o'clock. Right. Because right? we're trying to like right. throw you on the other end of the spectrum. You have to over exaggerate like, something to be to. able to come into middle of We things. always do that. Right. Like, we always did that in our lessons and you have to, and people are like, Whoa, it's like, yeah, this is just like, you have to explain to them like, Hey, yeah. it's just an exaggeration. Like right. our jobs as instructors, it's just like exaggeration management, you know, like right. how much are we actually exaggerating things? But I just had a really good visual when you said that is that when you when you think about like uh, why the ball is doing what it's doing, it's all related to these circles or these ovals that we're talking about and where they're placed at every single spot in the swing. Because like you said, if the club head circle or oval is too far behind the circle of your hands at pre-impact, then that's going to create a certain like gear effect or reaction right. for how the club's actually going to kick and how it's going to hit the ball, what quadrant of the ball it's going to hit, right? It's almost like you're trying to match up if there was like an oval or circle on what quadrant of the ball you were trying to hit, you're trying to match up those circles 
at every single spot and you're staying right. with your hands, the handle and the, cl- and the club. Mm-hmm. Right. So like if you're trying to hit the outside quadrant and you go inside too quick with your handle or your um, club head circle and it's like, whoa, now it's like red almost on like the ball or on the club mm-hmm. head or something like that. It'd be like a good visual for people. Right. Yeah. Cause yeah, like in golf, you know, it's like you can, uh, for the majority, if you get a consistent ball flight, you can play it most places if you can, you know, be consistent with it. But um, for the best players in the world, they're actually taking, like, there's, um, in a sense, like, 27 different ball flight possibilities <laughs> right. between trajectories of low, mid, and high, and then you got your different curves and straight. Right. Right? So if you take all that into consideration, it's like the pros are actually trying to not manipulate their swing a whole lot to hit all those different ones because they do use them all Yeah. Um, at some point. But um, that's it. I mean, and so it's like by understanding that, like, you get your stock move, you got to understand that with the, you know, again, trying to get a little inside out at a draw mm-hmm. from like, you know, being static, like in stock, we'll say. Right. And then from there, then you can hit your fade and stuff and, you know, a bigger hook if you need to and flight it the way you need to. And but right. starting off that way and understanding those options is very important. And one of the big things that we're always teaching people right off the bat, though, is just learn how to hit the inner quadrant of the golf ball. Mm-hmm. Like learn how to hit that first. Right. Then you can start to understand how to hit the middle part of the ball right. and then the outside part of the ball. Like, I think that's how it should work when you're learning golf. Like, start at the inside, then go to middle, and then go to outer. Don't start hitting the middle part of the ball because then you're going to start to develop all of these bad tendencies of, like, mm-hmm. hitting, maybe getting too steep and hitting the outside part of the ball without even, like, trying to because the gear effect, like, the club naturally wants to kick left. Right. Right, it wants to naturally hit the outside. We're just part trying of the ball. to learn at first how to con- like how to counteract it, which is why we're thinking so much advantage. of the inside of the ball. Right, right, right. opposed to it working against. And we've had you. people like on our Discord, and shout out to everybody on our Discord. If you haven't joined our Discord, um, get on that because you get a free lesson. Um, all the links are in the bottom. Um, but he said, like one of the big things he's helping is helping him right now is that when he's coming into the ball, the heel of the golf club driving at the inner quadrant was like the best thing for him because it really right. just is helping him like create more speed, mm-hmm. really keep his body in tilt, get the club path being consistent. Right. Like that one thought of just like inside quadrant of the ball mm-hmm. can fix like four different things. Absolutely. Yeah, it really like, helps a lot. Wait, of, why yeah. would I try to do all these different things in my swing if I'm trying to hit the inside part of the ball? Right. Right. So all the roadmaps start lining up and making more sense. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Inside part of the ball though. Um, you would talk about that a lot with your students, right? Of course, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And like, how would you describe that? Like, what would you say to them? Like, just draw a crosshair on the back of the ball as if it was flat. Yeah. Like put like a, make the back of the ball flat and then just put a crosshair. And it's like, you got your top quadrants mm-hmm. and then you have your bottom quadrants. You have yeah. inner and outer, right? And it's like, which one you're going to hit? It's going to determine kind of how the ball comes off. It's going to spin and then it's going to, you know, curve as well. Mm, got it. Yeah. So if you're hitting like a, I remember you were telling me this before and I thought it was really interesting and I think it would help a lot of people. It's if you're slicing the ball or if you're like snap hooking the ball, it's could be related to hitting the exact same quadrant of the ball. It's just the rate that the toe of the golf club is accelerating relative to the heel. Right. Is that correct? Yeah. Am I saying that right? Yeah. So yeah. like you basically are always hit like your worst shots that you ever hit are hitting like the top um, outer quadrant too much. Yes. And it's, of course, in, like unintentionally. Yeah. Right. Because, um, I mean, the pros can do it. Like you watch Bubba Watson when he hits <laughs> those crazy sling, like like slices, basically. Yeah. It's exactly what he's doing. But he's precise enough to deliver the energy of the club with his lever lag and release where he's still utilizing it. But if you're casting, which is, again, one of the most common problems in golf, you're likely to then hit more of that outer top quadrant because it's like you're, it's like you're coming in crashing like this to the golf ball, right? <laughs> right, right? Opposed to coming in shallow and holding the lag. And then, you know, we coming in and being able to compress the golf ball because you have to be able to squish the ball. Basically, whether it's if it's on the ground, you have to squish it in the ground. It doesn't matter what club you're hitting, even mm. if it's driver off the ground. Yeah. But and you, yeah. So basically, if you're making like a half swing, you can create more speed if the club is basically inside the hands like here let me see the club really quick Mm -hmm. like if you're basically coming into the ball and your club is here relative to the handle and you hit the ball and then release it and then you make the same swing and you're here and going that way more outside in opposed to inside out you could be swinging with like the same speed 
trying to make the same like rhythm and tempo swing and hit it much further with this inside out swing because the direction the club head is working relative to the handle. Natural gear effect. It's a natural gear effect head, of yeah. that like whip speed. Yeah. Right? Like talk about that a little bit. Like what that whip speed that we're trying to create is to Well it's trying to maximize speed of how this little like this object works <laughs> yeah. with like trying to hit the golf ball far. Right. Mm, right. So it's like it's a spring and I'm not gonna do it much like we can we can bend it from here. But yeah. It's like we're trying to like catapult the golf club. So right. if I catapult it like this way and the ball's here and I'm hitting like left of me parallel, it's like the club's gonna catapult this way. Mm. That's gonna cause a problem with my body reaction. Right. We want the club head to be moving its fastest when it gets its furthest point away from our body. Oh, so it's like a big spring. I got you. So we lever it back. That's a good way to think about it. We hold it. it and then we snap it away <laughs> right. and then it comes back at you. Which is why we like the strong grip. Right. Because the strong grip creates like basically the ultimate like slingshot to go boom. Like we yeah. talked about last episode, if we're trying to create the most speed, we're trying to get those fingers to be back of the palm as much as possible. Because now if you kept the tautness here with like your, um, we'll say like your palm pushing like this way and your lead arms locked, however much this goes and snaps away from you, that's how far the ball is going to go. Right. And that's how much speed you're going to generate. So for the average person that's using a weak grip or something like that, they're, when they're coming into the ball, their fingers are going more this way, which right. is not as much speed as you can create of the fingers going that way, right? Like the speed is how much the fingers are basically staying back of the palm as long as possible until you hit, like you said, the lead thigh, like we talked about in the last episode, and then the fingers are just going boom and snapping away. That's why we like the pump drill, because the pump drill, when you're coming into the ball, you're really like feeling what it feels like to keep the club head like up and back of the handle as long as possible to create the ultimate slingshot. But it's not just like a slingshot with no control. Like you're still pushing. You still want to control right. as you're getting that slingshot, right? Yeah, and that's why mm -hmm. that's why the grip is so important, right? With right. the claws. Because when you're slingshotting that away from you, you got to have control and stability. Right. Right? It's almost like with a tether ball. If like you, you hit it and then it like gets out to its furthest point away from the rope and then the string breaks. Right. And there goes your ball. <laughs> right. But right. the idea is like same with the golf club. Like you want to maintain the like... We're basically like the string, like that hand handle club relationship. It's like the basically the club head is like the tether ball. So it's like we want to maintain control of it so it doesn't end up going off track at any point. We want to keep it stable mm. because if you, I mean, you don't see a lot of swings where it's like perfect to pre impact. Yeah. Um, and then it goes completely crazy. I mean, yeah. I, I mean, it can, but um, if yeah, the body's if in the it, wrong it, position or something. Yeah, yeah. Right. But yeah, just try and do that. Well. Um, greatly help with just, again, yeah, being able to stay in balance and like not, you know, hurting yourself in golf, like when you're trying to swing. So yeah, it was cool. Somebody commented on one of our posts, um, earlier and they said, cause it was the one where I was saying like the golf swing is 90% hands and arms for a strong grip. And I mean, he was basically saying that he thinks that this is the reason that there's a lot of like back problems and stuff in golf now it's cause everybody's using their body so much. And it's like, yeah, if you just understood, like if you're sitting in this chair, like how could you create the most speed possible? Like you can't move your body faster than you can move your hands and arms. Right. Right. Like the speed, like this is it's where your the fast speed twitch is muscles at. relative it's, to your big muscles. Exactly. You know? And that's why those muscles also have to be like loose in a sense, where we talk about back to the Hogan thing Properly with the oily. Isolated. Yeah. Yeah. With the oily wrists, mm -hmm. because that's where the speed comes in, right? Like a lot of people, they think like, oh, I'm just going to hold it really light because I can like swing fast like this. But it's like, yeah, but you also have to like have that tautness. Yeah, there has right? to be. You have to utilize you your just, hands. It can't just be light and just loosey goosey the whole time. The bird can't like, be flying away. It can't be. Yeah, the cage is like just all over the place, you know. And the birds are just like, what's going on here? Yeah. But yeah, we want to keep it like you know secure and consistent. That's it. Correct. Just keep the holsters intact. Correct. Exactly. Yeah. The taut. The tautness. Right. Right. And that's really what being in this chair and learning the golf swing like this creates is it just really creates the ability for you to create this tautness and learn at every single spot, right? Like learn it here at the takeaway, like create it right off the bat. Cause if you don't create it right off the bat, you're already starting behind the eight ball. Right. Right. Like there's a reason that tour players are so meticulous with their setup and their grip and things mm -hmm. like that. It's cause they need that to be perfect because right. if that's off by like a little bit, then 
it's just harder to achieve like the certain checkpoints, right? Like yeah. you want to get, like imagine, like you said, we're, we're talking about the ovals and the circles, get the triangle right so you have that oval and tri- in circle, right? Mm-hmm. So then from there, it's like, okay, that oval's good. This oval's good. The oval around the club face is good. It's like, boom, okay, now I'm locked. And like even the body being in the right position too with the sternum, like you don't want to be too over here. <laughs> you don't want to be like here and then have the grip right, right? Like right. be centered over the ball. And then from there, it's like, okay, push, keep the t- keep the tautness in the elbows, keep the tautness here. And then the club's going to do a certain thing, whether you're with the weak grip, with the neutral grip, or with the strong grip, right? It's right. just, just equal. keeping that just equal. equal, exactly, equal tautness at every single spot. There you go. Um, yeah, so this is just kind of a really simple episode just for you to really start to understand, like, the importance of the the chair and things like that, yeah. right? Like, when we... Uh, again, we're just trying to kind of create, like starting last week, we're starting, we're trying to do an episode a week, Mm -hmm. um, really just because we're trying to build up to what we're about to do with our claw code videos and all of our archive videos that we're going to create. Right. Um, we're, we just kind of finalized everything over at the studio that's about to be finally wrapped up. Yep. Um, and then we'll get those videos over. Um, but we're really just trying to educate people on like, what's the stuff we're going to be talking about, right? Like we're going to be talking about this, this tautness and, um, creating the proper connection to the handle right. and how the hands are going to influence what the club is doing. And mm-hmm. if the wrists go this way, the club's going to do a certain thing. If the wrists go this way, the club's going to do a certain thing. Like Just equal tautness and riding the 45 circles with your hands and your club head. I love the like the visuals. If people really just take away anything from this episode, it's really just understanding how those circles and those ovals, um, whatever you want to kind of visualize them as, is... Those have to be matched up. First, they got to be created right at the setup, but then those have to be matched up at every single spot. If you want to be the most consistent, if you want to maybe do something a little bit different in the takeaway, maybe you don't want to be perfect in the takeaway and you want to go a little outside, that's fine. But at pre-impact, that circle has to be perfect. That circle has to be perfect. And that circle of the body has to be perfect in order to get the club to bottom out in the same spot every time and get the proper gear effect. Yeah. Right. The circles have to maintain their consistency. That's all. Yeah. Throughout exactly. the entire gear effect model, too. And then, like from pre to post impact, that little it's like circle. The plane is the circle ongoing. Exactly. Just broken into segments of how we're analyzing it. And then this little circle will go where he needs to go exactly. every single time, or he's going to come after you with his axe. There you go. <laughs> and you don't want to hit him in the trees or anything like that. Um, so, yeah, that's the big thing is that this all relates back to <clears throat> the circle of the golf ball, right? Like it's easy to visualize the circle of the hands, the handle and the club, because then you just relate it to the circle of the golf ball, right? And it's like, if you're hitting a certain part of the golf ball, he's flying a certain way, whether it's slicing or hooking, and it's all related to what you're doing here. Hand to handle the club relationship. That's what we're about. We're going to keep preaching it as we kind of keep going through content like this. Um, yeah. New episode a week. Thank you for all the support we've been getting yep, on our socials. You. Um, we hit 10,000 on TikTok. That was awesome. Thank you so much for all the support. Um, we still got, I think we got like one or two, uh, hats still available too in white and blue. Um, and we got a lot of cool stuff coming with more, more apparel and claw code videos and a lot of exciting stuff. So it's gonna be a fun, fun fall and winter. Um, and yeah, we just want to say thank you again for all the support we've been getting and, uh, we'll see you in the next episode. Thanks everybody for watching. Yep. Thanks.